everything that you learn. But we're going to start off with um, a grade three piece from the Associated Board um, syllabus, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. About two years ago, I was involved with helping them sort of kind of finalise and compile. I mean, quite a lot of the heavy lifting had been done by the time I joined the project, but they had some gaps with things like arrangements and new um, new pieces they wanted to commission, duets and things like that. And also they needed somebody just to go through and, and proofread all the, the books and everything. So it's a very much a team effort, a syllabus compilation. It's not like you're the only person involved in the process. There's a whole team of people who contribute to what might go in in terms of repertoire. But... I'm going to start off with a grade three piece, which is the Saltarello, which some of you may have played or might be teaching. Um, so what I thought I might try and do, although this is a bit nerve wracking, is playing a grade three piece under pressure uh, online. I will attempt to play this piece. Um, with any luck, if I play it quite well, I might get a merit. Um, if, I'm, if I'm really on form, I might get a distinction. And uh, probably because I haven't had coffee, I might just get a pass this morning. But anyway, I'll give you a rough idea. Interesting thing is there's a metronome mark at the top of every piece. Okay, this is a very common thing. It's not gospel. It's not the law, the metronome mark. It just gives you a, a kind of starting point. And quite often, particularly in student repertoire and books for grade exams, they tend to be pitched in a sort of middle ground, quite a safe area. Um, so there's quite often scope to go, you know, they, they always talk about sort of 10% slower and 10% faster. It's not quite as mathematical as that, but pieces often thrive in a variety of different speeds. And a very good thing to try, obviously, is to practice slowly, which I'm sure your teachers would have told you. But sometimes you find it's interesting if you go faster, you reach a point where the piece doesn't work anymore because the character changes if you go too fast and conversely if you go too slow the character changes because the piece is moving too slowly and it's taking too long to say what it has to say. So this one's marks crotch equals 126 it's probably about right. I think if I didn't have any metronome marking at all I would probably think more one in a bar. <laughs> So you could go quicker. Which I think actually feels quite nice. If I went too slow. It's still quite nice, but maybe it's reaching a certain sort of, you know, threshold where the music feels like it just needs a little bit more, a little bit more movement. Um, so, you know, that's actually that wasn't one of my 10 tips, but I found myself talking about metronome markings because I think they sometimes trouble people quite a lot and they think I have to play it at that speed. Um, quite often it's not really the case at all. And I always think of tempo and temperature. You know, think of a piece as being like a flower or a plant. It will flourish sometimes in a range of temperatures. And if the temperature gets too cold, it, the frost will kill it off. And if it gets too hot, Obviously, likewise, lack of water, etc., will kill it off. So pieces sometimes kind of thrive in quite a nice temperature range. They're quite resilient, but if you go too slow or too fast, then they start to kind of change or they don't work in that sense. So my first tip, I'm trying to make these proper 10 tips, as Vida and I discussed. So the first one was preparation at the beginning. Very common thing to think about. Make sure before you start, you get your first finger on the F sharp and you get your right hand nicely into position touching the fourth string and the first string. So I've actually got everything ready I need to be able to play the first bar. Well, not quite the shift, but obviously. Sometimes then what I'd also do is I'd feel out the first three notes, the F sharp, the G and the A, these notes. So I'm touching them in the left hand, getting used to them before I play them. Then I release, keep your first finger on, touch the right hand strings. And I know hopefully, even if I'm very nervous, that I'm gonna get the right notes on the first chord. All right, that applies with many, many pieces. Always make sure you prepare properly what you're going to have to do at the very beginning. Don't just drop in 
and play. So, for example, my, say my right hand hasn't touched the strings and I suddenly have to pluck them. It's quite difficult just to drop in and play those notes with no preparation. So, second point, this is a two-part piece. All right, it's a bass and a treble line. Now, admittedly, if I played just the bottom line, it's not quite so interesting, but it's a very, very important part of playing pieces which have different voices. So try the two voices separately, even though you want to be able to play them together. So if I played you just the bass line, Own. it doesn't sound terribly interesting but it's very very important it's the sort of foundations of what's going on on the top now if I take the bass line away we have the tune on the top so try practicing both lines independently of one another and then putting them back together and it makes you more aware of the bass line and it makes you also aware if you miss notes and you don't hear them with the same consistency of sound and projection. So that's my second tip. Third tip, shifting. Now the first thing you have to do here in terms of shifting is to go up to the B, right? Very common to make mistakes shifting. You might get, you know, B flat or a C natural. Doesn't sound quite so good then. So think very carefully about the way you shift. And also in this case, you could possibly go up on four and come down on two. And I'll show you what I mean. So up on finger four, finger two plays the A and then comes down, okay? So you're going down on a different finger to the one you came up. Now it's not necessarily the correct fingering, it's just an alternative fingering. I could come back down on finger four and just slide finger four up and down and that's absolutely fine but generally finger four is a bit weaker so try and avoid sliding around on it too much sometimes you're slightly better off using stronger fingers like one and two to shift up and down not without exception all right and sometimes I'll put a line um, down through the score in the place where I'll actually shift back so when I come back to the G natural in bar two. I might put a line there just to show me exactly where I'm coming down into a new position. Okay, tip number four, practice your slurs on their own. Okay, so in bar seven, we have some slurs. Quite a tricky bar. This one here. Now what I could do is just trap the first slur. Just try rotating it round a few times, okay? And then join it with the E. So it's quite military, it's like sort of practicing something almost in a drill. Um, you know when you have, uh, in England they have a store called Ikea, the Ikea, the, the Swedish furniture place. Do you know this place? And you sometimes go in and they have a machine that's testing a drawer, you know, and it's opening it up and and closing the drawer about three million times and it says this drawer has been opened you know 7,643 times or something so this is kind of what you have to do it's what I call the Ikea drawer technique <laughs> so you just have to keep playing it over and over again you can always tell when you've done it enough because your parents if you have parents will tell you to shut up <laughs> so can you play something else apart from that slur Okay, so here's the last one. Actually, slowing on to open strings is surprisingly tricky. Try and be careful you don't squash them. Like this, a very common fault. And sometimes when you go slower, it's like a musical ambulance. you have to control the slur more carefully all right so take take little things out from the piece and you know it's a bit like a car you might sort of take the spark plugs out and replace them or a bulb you know something like that you take little pieces out and practice them on their own okay with the descending slur this is tip number five 
Make sure you place both fingers down in the left hand before you execute them. All right, so bar six, we finish with an F sharp. When we go into bar seven, we have to play a G and you keep the first finger on so that you've got both notes of the descending slur in position already. It's no good trying to slur onto the F sharp as you're bucking. So if I was playing this, I would place both down try and remember that it's not the same when you're moving upwards when you're doing an ascending slur it depends whether you're coming back to the note really if I was doing this I would hold my first finger if I'm doing this then I'm going to let go of my first finger so it depends always on the context but just make sure that you press both fingers down when you're doing a descending slur okay tip number six three note chords. So in bar nine, we have some three note chords. The piece has been two part texture up until this point. Now it moves into three voices. So if I play that bar on its own, going into bar 10, the first thing you can do is play the inner voice, the B, the B and the D. So we've got this little voice in the middle. Again, just like we got to know the bass line, make sure you play that inner voice on its own. If it was a string trio, for example, it might be violin two, two violins and a cello, or it might be the, you know, the viola part, as it were. So we're looking at that inner voice, the alto line, perhaps, trying to make sure we know how that sounds on its own. And if I flip my screen round, this is my next tip, you can practice playing just the open string. So I've written out bar nine into bar 10, just as open strings. So hopefully you can see that. All right, that's uh, on Sibelius. I will just enlarge it a little bit so it's reasonably clear. So if I play those, doesn't sound very interesting, of course. If I add the left hand note, can you see, take the left hand away, sometimes I do that, I'll mine the left hand, it looks a bit weird, it's what I call how to get a tube carriage to yourself, people see you practicing like this on the train and they stay well clear of you, okay so there's, there's a tip, Try right hand on its own with the three part texture, especially there. Get used to the string spacings and the things that you have to do underneath the notes, as it were, and then add your left hand notes back in. Right, where are we? Yes, tip number eight. Use the A finger. Um, where is it marked in here? Bar 13, yes. There's some quite good fingerings written in here that you can practice trying. So bar 13, it's got the, the A finger. I have a terrible joke, because this is called the annular finger, which I always joke it's the annular finger because people use it once a year. It's not very funny, but it, there's a kind of, most guitarists will identify with that. that. I think it's fair to say we probably all try and avoid this finger, don't we? Right, because it doesn't feel quite as strong as the other fingers. So it's a self-reinforcing problem because the less you use it, the stronger the other fingers get, and then the less you want to use the A finger, all right? So try and get used to using it, especially here in bar, in bar 13, your thumb and your index are already playing the lower two voices, all right? So they're playing the underneath part. Like that. So they're already doing that. They can't really come up and play the other stuff. They're trying to, they're busy trying to do this stuff underneath. So you need to bring your A finger into the equation easy but try it it's not the only way of playing the right hand but whenever you see the A finger marked always try it and have a go because that's the way you'll develop your your right hand technique so that the A finger hopefully starts to feel a bit more secure and you can practice playing M A scales instead of I I M scales all the time practice using M and A and also I and A which is very good index to the A finger which is not such a common right hand um, fingering in terms of technical work but it's actually a very good if you if you look at your right hand you'll see that your index and your a finger the third finger are on they're on different tendons 
the middle finger and the A finger are on the same tendon. So that's why they feel uncomfortable to play, because they're sort of joined, as it were. But I and A actually feel, if you try moving I and A on their own, they're relatively straightforward to do. I don't think you can do that. Can you make your, can you make your A finger come down you know, on its own? It's quite interesting sometimes to find out if you can move fingers independently of one another. <laughs> I should take a screenshot at this point. Looks like everyone's sort of waving in a slightly strange fashion. Why don't we wave like that? It's interesting, isn't it? Why don't we evolve to wave like that? I suppose it's not as obvious. Anyway, I've gone off on a strange tangent, as is often the case during my lessons. Um, so how are we doing? I'm getting there. So tip number nine, bar 10, hold the, re hold the G to return. Yes, to return to in bar 11. I had to rem remind myself of what I meant. So when you get to bar 10, you finish on a G and in a minute you've got to play it again. So I'm quite lazy. I can't be bothered to do anything more than I have to really. So I'm going to keep that G on and then when I play the next bar, it's already there. Can you see? Hold it. Don't lift it off. Because then if you lift it off, when you put it down again, you might miss. So if you've already got it in position, kind of recycling the note and, and reusing it to make sure that you keep your left hand nice and accurate. And then my final tip for this piece, tip number 10, try shifting to four on the last G in bar 12. Yes. So if you look in bar 13, we have to play the first note in the upper part with finger four. So instead of waiting for that bar and then jumping to get to the three note chord, like this. Sometimes what I do is what I call an anticipatory shift. I anticipate the movement. You move on the last G of the previous bar and you get it in position. And then you've already got the first note in the upper part of the chord ready. So if I show you that again, shift. So you're shifting off the beat, not on the beat. You know, they're very small hidden things like a lot of things in guitar playing that you can't really see and you can't hear well you can hear the musical effects but you can't really see them going on in the in the sort of background but they're the things that often give you much more technical security and left hand um, legato as well particularly so that's my little mini tour through um, that first piece so we're going to move on now if you want to jot down any questions or anything at any point, I'm going to try and scan through the chat at the end. Right, piece number two. Paganini, who of course was a violinist and a guitarist. So my first tip on this, well it's a sort of general observation more than anything else, is that this piece is in the key of F major. Now, that doesn't sound earth-shatteringly interesting, but guitar music generally is often not in the key of F major, partly because there's no open string in the bass for F major. It's quite an awkward key in some ways to play in. So try and get used to that particular key. Whichever key your piece is in, think about the key relationships if you're playing in a tonal world. So, for example, in F major, F is the tonic, B flat is the subdominant and C major is the dominant. C major is quite a nice open key, which we're all very familiar with, but in this context it's the dominant and not the tonic. The relative minor is D minor. So you can think about the key relationships and then sometimes when you're practicing, try and practice your scales and your arpeggios in relation to the piece that you're playing. So if I was in the key of F major, I might practice an F major scale. familiarizing myself if you like with the vocabulary of that particular key and of course it's got a flat I mean I'm slightly stereotyping guitarist here but we don't really do flats we do sharps <laughs> but we're not very good with flats guitar music doesn't often go into keys like B flat major or E flat major or C minor and actually they're really interesting keys but mentally and physically sometimes on the guitar they're harder to think and harder to play so part of the challenge of this piece is playing in F major 
and as you can see there's a barre in bar one so it gets off to quite a tricky start now if you look there are some upbeats at the beginning your opening little phrase now what I would probably do at the very beginning is I would place the small barret down right at the beginning there's a small barret that covers just two strings the C and the F so place that down at the beginning with the F and the A for the full chord and I've got again I've got everything ready can you see I've got the whole shape for bar one I've got the shape in the right hand with my thumb pressing down and my index and middle on the top two strings. I've got everything into position. Don't play the first C as it were normally and then jump to the barre. That can be quite tricky, especially at the beginning. Have the whole thing down. You can just loop the bar. I mean, I'm going to talk about that later on actually in another piece, but looping. the Ikea draw test again. Sometimes I like to do things, you know, maybe five times. Two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so you're, you're kind of playing in real time, but just trapping a little bit and rotating it round. A bit like the potter's wheel when you see people shaping you know, a ceramics on a wheel and they kind of, you know, gradually alter the shape and, and improve the shape. So um, hold F in bar one and E in bar two through the bar. I just need to decipher my own writing. Hold F in bar one and E in bar two. Oh yes, that's right, yeah. Um, at the very beginning in bar one, I would probably hold the third finger on the F in the bass. Now, strictly speaking, it's marked as a crotchet, so you might think, oh, I've got to lift it off. But actually, it's an implied resonance, really. It implies, because it's a harmony note, that it should ring. And the same in the next bar, I would probably hold the E. All right, so you're letting that second finger ring on all the way through the bar, even though it's only marked for a crotchet. So note values are strange, and it's a, it's a very... Slightly odd thing, I'm sure all teachers will relate to this. One minute you're saying to your students, look, that's only a crotchet, let go of it. You know, you don't need to hold it. And the next minute you're saying, yeah, I know that's a crotchet, but hold it because it's supposed to ring over. All right, so there, there are always these inconsistencies in notation where the rules don't always apply in completely the same way. And, you know, I can't stress that enough, that notation is extremely important and it's really, really important to start from the page and what's written but it's only an approximation. It's a sort of two-dimensional representation of something that exists, if you like, in four dimensions, really, in reality. If you imagine, um, I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but you know, if you imagine a picture of the Grand Canyon on a computer screen, it looks pretty good, but I'm sure it's absolutely nothing like the feeling of going and stepping out and standing in front of the Grand Canyon and seeing you know, the expanse and the hugeness of the whole thing. So you can't convey that on a piece of paper, however nice the photograph or the picture, and it doesn't convey all sorts of other things like the temperature and the smell and the light and all those sort of things and the sounds that you hear. And actually music in some senses, although it's an extremely different thing, has similar properties. It's just compressed down onto this page, which is great because it means we can all communicate and show one another how to play the music. But at the same time, it's only really just a starting point and it, it's the launch pad for you to listen to other players, listen to other music, listen to different instrumental music by the same composer, you know, make sure it's Paganini, you listen to some of the violin music that he wrote. Uh, he wrote wonderful duos actually for guitar and violin as well. So there's a whole sort of um, world out there that sometimes then helps you to understand the music when you see it on the page. It's just like if you know someone's voice and then you read a book or an article or a magazine where they've written something, you, you can kind of connect more with what they're saying because of it. Okay, let's move on to my next point. Um, Try second, I have to remind myself what I wrote because I came up with these things a few days ago. Try a second position in bar nine as well as the third written. Uh, now, what did I mean by that? Uh, second position in bar nine. Six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, so when you get to the first repeat on the second line, it starts to move key. All right, there's a slightly awkward fingering in the left hand. Please note the A finger over the top as well, which you're all going to practice, of course. AMA. I might possibly do AMI or IMA. I mean, you, know, you can do, there's no, there are kind of good fingerings and bad fingerings, but sometimes there's not an absolutely definitive solution of right hand fingering. But this is marked to be played in third position. Because I think uh, Richard Wright, the editor, is probably wanting you to try and practice developing your third and fourth finger in the left hand. So practice that, you know, try and get used to that. But you can also do it in second position. This always really confuses non-guitarists. When you play things in different positions. You can do it up there as well, 10th position. Don't do that one, that's not a very good one. So just occasionally, you know, there might be a fingering in the book, and again, it's not always gospel. And as a student, it's very difficult. Obviously, if you're working with a teacher, make sure you take your advice and, um, you know, don't just sort of be deliberately contrarian. But sometimes there can be other fingerings that might be slightly more comfortable for you. You know, if you put on a jacket, it might fit someone else and not fit you. And fingerings are a bit like that because they're not always designed to fit your hand. Everybody's hand has slightly different shapes and lengths. We did this last time, actually. We can try another hand experiment where you hold up your hands and you see whether your index finger is the same length, shorter or longer, than your A finger in the right hand and the left hand. So mine are there. So I can see Vida has got more, yours are more level, I think. Oh no, maybe in the, in the right hand. Interesting. Can you see? So the, the, our length of fingers is going to be different. So if my A finger is a lot longer than my index finger, but yours is level, that will then affect which fingering sometimes feel comfortable for me and which ones feel comfortable for you. So that's a possible fingering alternative that you could do in that particular bar, bar nine. Bar 11, so this is tip number five, bar 11, finger four on the D. And what am I talking about here? I've got no idea what I'm talking about. Bar 11, finger four on the D of the third fret. Just bear with me a second, bar 11. Oh yes, yeah. So when you get to bar 11, Because you've got to play a C in the bass in the next bar, don't play the D at the end of the bar with your third finger, because that's got to jump across. All right, so what I would do is I would put my fourth finger on the D, and then my third finger is free to climb across, and then you get better left hand legato. So if you look at the end of bar 10, it's marked with finger four on the G. And you keep your fourth finger at the third fret. In first position, quite often, the fourth finger is more comfortable at third fret than the third finger. Because the frets are very slight. The first position is a slightly extended position where your hand doesn't quite naturally sit. If you've got a guitar, try it. So you put your fingers down at first position. If you keep your left hand totally relaxed and you put it at first fret, you will probably find that your fingers fall over only three frets. All right. If I want to make my third finger get to the third fret, I've got to stretch very slightly. So quite often you find in first position that the fourth finger can feel easier at the third fret. So if I play bar 10 into bar 11, I'm using my fourth finger on that note at the end of that bar. So try and look out for that. That happens quite a lot in the left hand generally. Bar 26, swapping fingers on the same note. 27, 26. Oh yes, yeah. So we get down to... All right, what we're doing... halfway through bar 26 which is on the fifth line last bar and then we swap so there's a positional shift halfway through the bar and it matches the phrasing because we're going da, 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 so it 
helps with the phrasing and it also helps with the technical control. So we get that feeling of a sentence and a comma, like the, you know, like we would do if we were writing prose. Um, you could try a little te practice technique for that, which is just to play the same note and keep swapping your finger. Another one to drive your uh, parents mad. So I'm playing exactly the same note and just swapping from one finger to another. A very good one if you try it. I, I'm never very good at this. Some of my students are very good at it. It's to try and play the same note and you have to move without it stopping ringing. See if you can, see if you can go down and come back again. Organists do this quite a lot, you know, they'll play a note and then they swap fingers on it. You probably can't see my keyboard here, wherever we set up that end, yeah. So they'll swap fingers on notes. So you might come down on your thumb and swap on the same key to other fingers so that you can reach down. So it's quite it's quite a, a finesse technique, but it's a very useful one. So next one, next tip, where did I get to? Bar 28, use three and four on the second note chord. Yes, that's right. Um, bar 27 into bar 28. Um, try and avoid using finger two on the F and finger three on the G because they feel comfortable. Because they're stronger, this is the left hand equivalent of the A finger. Our little finger is weak. All right. If you look at your little finger, it's the shortest one. It's very small. It's pretty weak. We don't use it a lot. So the trick to making it stronger is to use it a bit more, but we often tend to try and avoid it. So instead of jumping up to finger two and three, make sure you're using fingers three and four. All right. And it really starts to help develop the outer part of your left hand, the strength you need in this part. Your thumb side of the hand is going to be much, much stronger naturally, but the outer part is generally going to be a bit weaker, and that's where you need to build up the strength in your left hand. So it connects with what we were talking about a minute ago, which is using your fourth finger at the third fret. Okay, so try and do that. Try not to avoid fourth finger and the A finger in the right hand. They're sort of connected in a way. Look out for accidental C sharps, F sharps, and F naturals. This is my next tip. Um, Music is often written, or nearly always written, in black and white, but I recommend highlighter pens or coloured pencils or things like that to to highlight, especially things like dynamics, because they often get camouflaged or not really noticed. It's what I call the small print. You always have to read the small print of the document very carefully. Music's a bit like that. You've got to read your small print. So when you get to um, you know, certain points in the piece, especially when quite often when it's modulating or gradually changing the harmony or the key, you get an accidental. So the first one, for example, is in bar nine, the C sharp. And then it's quite easy sometimes to forget that might carry on all the way through the bar, or you might miss the accidental that cancels it out. For example, end of bar 26, we've got an F natural. So put a ring around these things because if you put a coloured ring or some kind of ring, you know, or any way of highlighting it, when you're looking at the music, your visual memory is always in play. OK, so so when you're looking along the score, every time you look at it, somehow that is going into your mind as part of the tools you use to remember music. So if every time you scan past that line, you see a big ring around it, you notice it, you think about it, it's there. It starts to happen subconsciously, even if you're not necessarily kind of remembering it. But it's very easy to miss those kind of things because everything is written in the same colour. You know, the writing, the letters are written in the same colour, marks of articulation, right hand fingerings, the title of the piece. It's all black and white. So, you know, give it some kind of technicolour quality to help you notice and remember things on the page. So that was my next tip, the highlighting of dynamics using colours. You can, if you don't want to, you know, if you don't want to spoil a nice, nice book that you've got, just run a page off on a scanner or something, and then you can, you know, you can graffiti it to your heart's content and just have it there as your sort of. I quite often like having that sort of practice copy, 
So, you know, keep, keep a nice, pristine copy at the end. And then right at the very end of the process, you can write in all your fingerings and your ideas when you're finished. And you can have some practice copies along the way that you can maybe, you know, rub things out and sort of experiment with ideas. OK, and the final tip for this piece is to try and observe bass rests. So there are quite a few places here where we don't necessarily want the bass notes to ring on. So sometimes that problem is solved automatically because your left hand fingers lift off thereby creating a rest, so we don't need to worry too much about that. So for example, in bar one, two, three, bar three, you have an F in the bass. As soon as I shift, the F comes off, so I don't have to worry too much about creating the rest. Maybe the next bar I do. I have to make sure I lift off the C in the bass on the second B. I could hold it, but that's not really what's marked that off at that point so that's that's a rest created by lifting and releasing in other parts of the piece we have open strings ringing so for example in bar nine we've got an A in the bass now if we don't do anything that's going to ring on underneath and actually it won't sound particularly bad but what you can practice doing is damping the A with your thumb on the second beat. The same digit that you use to play the note comes back to touch the string, all right? So I'll try and show you that in slow. Like that. Can you see my thumb touching the A string? Like that. Same thing there with the D. So the, the right hand is coming in to damp the string to make sure we get the right duration of bass note. Now, it doesn't always seem that important. You might be thinking, well, why couldn't I just let them ring on? And sometimes they sound fine. If I let them ring, they're probably okay. One problem there is that the D rings over the G and then it creates the wrong harmony. Okay, so we're not getting quite the right harmony then in bar 26 if the D is ringing over from bar 25. And sometimes you can also go and damp the notes after you've played them. So for example, let's say I let the D ring on. As I play the G, I can drop back and damp the D retrospectively after I've played it. And these are quite tricky things in the right hand, because let's face it, it's hard enough playing the guitar as it is. So it, you know, it's a bit like we're spinning all these plates in the air, and all of a sudden someone comes along with another plate and says, oh yeah, just one other thing, can you just stop those bass notes from ringing on, please, in the bass? You're thinking, how am I going to do that? I've got, I've got nothing, you know, nothing spare, nothing left to kind of damp the string. So you have to think sometimes of these um, articulations as being proper events, like playing a note. Imagine I played, for example, in bar 26, two Gs. Right, like that. So I'm playing an extra note in the bass. Now imagine I just touch the string on the second one instead of playing it. But it's hard for the right hand because your brain, whenever it touches the string, wants to play it. So it's thinking, oh, I've got a message. I've got to touch that string. That means I've got to play it. But what you're saying to your brain is, touch the string, but don't play it. Or touch the string and get ready for the next note. Don't play it yet. Play it in a minute. And that's quite tricky because you're trying to do the things in the present now, but you're also trying to think what's happening tomorrow at the same time. And that's what makes it hard in the right hand. But have a go at doing these things because they're what I call upper dimensions of right hand technique. We can all pluck the strings you know, with a bit of practice, but sometimes getting exactly the right voicing and duration of notes is surprisingly tricky. And if you imagine, you know, you were a cellist in the string quartet, if you had a rest marked, you would observe the rest. You wouldn't let your note ring on and just think, oh, I'm going to play a minim instead of a crotch dip because I can't be bothered to stop it from ringing over. You would be very meticulous about that bass line. So in the same way the cellist would be meticulous, our thumb has got to be meticulous in the same way as though it was, let's say, the cello in the lower part. So it's got some quite interesting challenges in it, this piece. And um, hopefully those will help you improve them or you might find them useful if you're teaching them. Good. Two down. I'm just going to have a look at some uh, right. Let me just check my hand. That's okay. Good. Okay. 
Someone had a question about uh, how to do the left hand part of bar nine of the Saltarello, which I think we did, but I'll just go back over that in case you missed it. The left hand part. So this is just going back to the previous piece. Someone had a question about how to do the left hand part of bar nine of the piece. My advice would be just to follow the fingering in the book, finger four on the G, right hand fingers would be, for me, P-I-M on the first three notes. And you might remember, I'll just run it past again if it's useful, I'll share the screen. If you look at this, this gives you the right hand open strings. Okay, so that's the, the right hand that's going on in bar I add the left hand, put the fourth finger on the G, second finger on the E, then hold those notes and slide up two frets to the next shape, to third position. And again, I'll do my Ikea draw technique. next bar. All right, so essentially it's your fourth finger that's playing the melody all the way through that bar up to the top. Hopefully that helps um, for whoever was uh, needing a bit of advice on that. Okay, let's go Thank on to the next piece. Now what was our next one? My filing system's going quite well at the moment. And that's, uh, yes, that's this piece. So this is The Melancholy by Cost. Again, very slow metronome mark. I don't know what metronome mark you've got on this piece, but mine has crotchet equals 48 which is actually very slow. Sometimes it's quite hard on the guitar to play slowly because our sound is always decaying away. It's not like playing a note on the cello or the violin or singing a note or playing a note on the organ or blowing a note on an oboe or a flute where you can sustain the sound. Our sound in the envelope is always gradually fading away. So in order to sometimes have sound present in several beats time. You have to project a reasonable amount of volume. So when you're playing slowly, I think these issues become more of a factor perhaps. But just make a note of that metronome marking, 48. It's not particularly quick. It's obviously slower than a second. A second is a very good way sometimes of just roughly getting a feel for the speed of a piece or a rhythmic unit. So it's about what? It's four fifths, isn't it? My maths isn't too bad. Four fifths, is that right? Yeah, five twelves are sixty, four twelves are forty-eight. Five four fifths of um a second, roughly, for your crotchet beat. It's probably about that, isn't it? That's my guess. So sometimes, you know, it's quite important to get the feel in your mind of the sort of environment. Obviously, if it's melancholy, there's a certain sort of sadness and you know reflective quality that if we go too fast it's not going to work as a piece. If I went quickly. It's not going to sound melancholy at all. So obviously the tempo, you know, I could be impressed by that musically. So say you did that in the exam, the examiner might think, well, yeah, they've kind of got good facility, but they've completely misunderstood the nature of the piece because it's supposed to be much, much slower than that. And the challenge sometimes is playing slowly. sort of territory of the melancholy that we need you know and without getting too um introspective and depressive it's quite good sometimes to relate these concepts to your own feelings of melancholy you know when think of occasions sometimes when you feel slightly more downbeat or depressed or reflective actually sometimes melancholy is a sort of strangely pleasant um sensation and um 
I mean, I'm going off on a tangent here, but in the Renaissance, it was quite sort of widely celebrated in a strange sort of way. And sometimes uh, you can have melancholy. Nostalgia is quite a good example where you're kind of sad looking back on things that you were happy at the time. So sometimes you're sad because you remember happy times. So this is kind of mixed emotions that you can have in a piece. So sometimes just translating something of your own sensation of what that word means helps you to find a way of expressing something in the music that's a bit more personal. Um, so again, I've written down here as tip number one, planting and preparation of right hand fingers at the start. So just like we did in the previous piece, we get our second finger down on the E in, in the fourth string, right hand planted on the strings, and I've written here bass, thumb notes, etc. Yes. There's lots of places where you can prepare. And if you look in the very first bar, there are some rests after the first uh, three notes in the upper line. All right, so in order to execute those, if we're going to do them literally, we have to touch those strings with the same fingers we plucked them with while we play the D sharp. Okay, it's quite tricky to convey this on the internet, but... All right, I'll try and get my... I can sort of see myself on camera a bit. All right, like that. What that also does is it prepares your fingers for the next arpeggio. See, so by placing your index and your middle on those strings, not only do you achieve the rest, you also create the right hand shape for the arpeggio that comes next. And make a note that the D sharp to the E is a slur, which is very different to going. It's different to going. slightly different inflection. All right, think of violin, separate bows as opposed to a slurred bow, you know, tonguing in wind playing as opposed to slurring. It's that kind of feel. All right, so again, there's some sort of small details. You know, sometimes I talk about fine detail or the finesse required. So sometimes people arrive at the notes quite well. That's kind of correct, but is slightly more exact. And it's this sort of, you know, almost like the, the French polish on the top of the guitar. It's the sort of French polish that we need in your playing that takes it up to that higher level that makes it sound really, really good. And sometimes we might listen to two players playing the same piece and it's hard to tell, but one of them somehow sounds better in a way that's hard to define. And it's often because of these very, very small details that think, you know, think of all sorts of things in the world. You know, the, the top 10 tennis players have something that's just a little bit more than someone maybe who's, you know, in the top 100, but not quite breaking into that, you know, magic top 16 or whatever it is. Um, not that music's quite the same as that sort of thing, but I'm sure you, uh, you understand the analogy. Okay, harmonics, tip number two. Write in the numbers for your harmonics, okay, because Harmonics, they, they, they can be found on the guitar in all sorts of different locations. You often have to sort of jump around all over the place to find them. So the usual sort of spatial relationships you see on the stave, let's say we looked at bar four where you have these harmonics, they don't always exist. They, they go down through the stave and sometimes to play harmonics you have to sort of jump left, right, up, down, all over the place. So there's sometimes a contradiction between how they look on the stave and how they manifest themselves when you're moving around in the left hand. So in this one, for example, I would just write in, if your score hasn't got them already, 12, 12, 12, seven, and put the uh, rings in to remind you which string you need to be playing them on. I always remember, is it, was it Peter Knuckles' book, The Guitarist's Way? I always, always remember this, where he says, the number of the ring is the number of the string. I've always liked that one. <laughs> so the number of the ring is the number of the string. So this would be 12 on the second string, 12 on the third string, or seven on the fifth string. Okay, so, and try and remember almost like a map, almost like join the dots. So you might think 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, seven. 
12, 12, 12, 7. Da, 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 da. So sometimes I think of shapes and lines, like a sort of you know footpath up the mountain or something. And that's kind of how I remember how to get round. It's almost like memorising a map of some kind. And you can think that when you get there. 12, you know, tell yourself. Sometimes I talk to myself. First sign of madness. 12 fret. 7, you know, or you could say the numbers. 12, 12, 12, 7. Right? Then you need to think sometimes about the fingers that you use to play those harmonics. All right? So we've arrived at the harmonics, that's the first bit, so we know where they are. But what we have to do is be consistent about the finger we play them with. I would probably use the fourth finger in the left hand because A, it's nearest, and B, it's the smallest and lightest. But then I probably wouldn't use fourth finger for the fifth string because that's quite a long way to travel. So when I'm playing 12th fret, the finger that's nearest is finger one. All right, so instead of jumping around and maybe doing this, where I might miss, what I would probably do is splay out my left hand in a slight sort of, uh, you know, diagonal shape. What is that shape? I'm not quite sure what you put it. Almost like a W, isn't it, in a strange kind of way. Can you see? And then I'm ready to play those notes already. And I might get in that position when I shift up. So as soon as I play the open strings, I'm up. So don't wait until you have to play the harmonics. Move on the open strings. So sometimes when you're playing open strings, we think of them as easy things, which they are in some ways. But often what you can do is be doing something else while you're playing the open strings. You might have an itchy nose. You can scratch. No, don't do that. But you get the idea, all right? It's this, you can do other things while you're playing the open strings. Up. All right, so I'm practicing getting there early. Then I'm in the position hovering. I can do is I can reach them with relatively little movement so that's that's what I would recommend certainly with harmonics because they're quite tricky to remember and just be careful of pitching as well because on my score they look like they're at this pitch all right so they're written at that pitch but they will sound at this pitch okay so they're going to sound an octave higher and one of the slightly problematic things in guitar music is that harmonics in some ways have never become completely standardised. They're often written in slightly different ways in different editions. Some people use diamonds, some people use traditional note heads, some people put 8 VE, some people just write the numbers, you know, it, some people just put the string numbers. So you, you sometimes get these um, little moments of confusion where it's not quite clear exactly which register um, you should be playing harmonics at. But they're a lovely sound. They tell you a lot also about projection because when you hear a harmonic, however large the concert hall you're in, you can normally hear it. And it tells you something really interesting about the nature of sound and projection. It's not to do necessarily with power. It's to do with the quality of the sound. So a harmonic has a very, very distinct sound. It's very, very clear and it will carry to the back of most reasonably you know, sized concert halls without amplification. Whereas you can play other notes very quietly and they won't carry. So, you know, just, just bear that in mind as a general thought. I've always found it a kind of fascinating thing about guitar playing that harmonics cut through and they have a certain quality that will always carry. Okay, now what have I written next? Yes, glissandi, slides in other words, sliding up and down the guitar. Fifth string bar five. So there's a string, there's a slide here. Just be careful, glissandi are quite tricky things to make sound tasteful. I always think there's a slight danger that they can sound a bit like slipping on a banana skin. You know, if you're not careful. We don't, we don't want to hear too much of the notes in between. Sometimes you have to shift quite late. I always think of Villa Lobos not playing like that. Happens a lot, this glitz in guitar writing. careful in the way that you gliss. It's just a very, very slight slide. It's almost like a vocalism. We wouldn't go like an air raid siren going off. 
Uh, yeah. You might just have a little bit of an elision sort of at, you know, at the end. Um, there's another one later on, major section G first string. Yes, when you have the G sharp coming up. All right, so there's some lovely ones later on in the major section on the fourth line. These ones. And a gliss produces a very different characteristic to a slur. It's quite different to going. All right, so again, it's this little, you know, just very slight inflection of the line that makes it sound stylistically correct. If I plucked them all, it's correct. It's, the notes are correct, the rhythm is correct, if you like, but it's not got quite the right inflection. Can you hear the difference? And, and these sort of small details are, you know, the things, like I said, that make sometimes the style become clearer. So let's say you're a student and you're doing an exam, and sometimes an examiner comments on um, the stylistic qualities of something or an awareness of the style. These are some of the things that often they're talking about, the sort of character in a broader sense of how things sound. So it's a bit like, um, you know, reading Shakespeare. You can read the words, but you have to read them in the, in the style of the character who's playing those words, and you have to get into their mind to understand the style and the sort of way they would be thinking in order to make that come across in the right way. It's quite easy to learn the words. But then you kind of reach a starting point once you've learned the notes. You're kind of at the beginning. And that's how a lot of singers think. They get the notes and then what you're dealing with is the really interesting stuff, the interpretation. So learning all the notes is not the end. That sort of takes you to the, the starting line. And then you're kind of, you know, up and running and talking about the really interesting stuff, which is how you make it sound musically interesting. So, you know, look out for the glissandi. Have, practice, sometimes you can practice moving from one fret to another. You know, if I go from first finger to the fifth fret, that's quite a different gliss to going up to a D. You know, and so you can sometimes take these things out and make little exercises out of them. You know, if you find it hard moving on your fourth finger, just practice a few of them. Don't press too hard, because you might find your finger starts to get a bit sore if you just keep doing it over and over again. Um, prepare half barre at five, line three, bar three. Ah, oh, yes. So this is my, I'm losing track of which tip I'm on now. Tip number four for this one. So line three, we have a little phrase that goes. Just here. All right, and you have a barre in the third bar of the third line. So when I arrive at the beginning of that bar, I've got the barre already in position. I'm not going to do the slur and then try and move across. All right, I've got the whole thing down. All right, so one of the tricky things sometimes when you're reading notation is that if you read sequentially, that barre looks like it arrives on the second quaver beat of the bar. But actually, the initiation and the preparation of it happen before that point, maybe at the very beginning of the bar, but it's not written into the music. It's just something you have to be aware of, you know, preparing for what's coming up. Those of us old enough to remember vinyl records, although I know they have made a comeback, will remember that thing. Do you remember one that before the record started, sometimes you would hear the sound of the track starting just before the track started? So you'd hear a little echo, a sort of pre-echo of the tune you were going to listen to. And this technically, sometimes you get these pre-echoes, these things where you put things down ahead of when you play them, and then synchronization works really, really well. Sometimes if you wait till the very moment you have to execute things, then you end up with problems and your left hand finds it harder to coordinate what's going on. So sometimes I'll put a little arrow, I might put an arrow backwards from a chord in the score, so it reminds me, again, visually, to think, right, this is where I'm going to place this chord down. It's part of this beat and not that beat later on. So again, preparations, very, very important. What's that old Scott Tennant one he, he, he draws out in um, Pumping Nylon? Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. It's a good one. <laughs> I wish I'd paid attention to it half of my life, though, that's a problem. Um, 
That's the trouble. When you're a teacher, you realise what a massive hypocrite you are once you start teaching. You think, that's such a great idea. Why don't I do that? <laughs> okay, bar uh, number five, colour changes. So when you change key, sometimes it's quite nice to do something else when you change key. So obviously the music is changing its mood and its character. So it could be that, you know, you've been in E minor for uh, the first chunk of the piece you might find you've been playing with a certain colour and a certain dynamic. And when the music moves to E major, obviously it changes its sonority in terms of the key, but it might be nice then sometimes to change the right hand colour or to change the dynamic or to slightly elasticate the phrasing in a certain way. So let's say I was playing the end of the minor section. <laughs> Then, you know, maybe move to a sweeter part of the guitar. You get the idea, right? So the beginning might have been... Whoops, I missed my shift. I need to practice my shift. Always practice shifts without looking as well. Feel of the shift as well. So that's got a very different colour maybe. When I get to the major section, so it's changing character in a very different way. You know the light, if you think of that as a time of day, that's the afternoon we started in the morning. So the light's changed. So the light changes, we change the colour, the music sort of feels like it's you know metamorphosizing, if that's the right word changing and uh, and sort of evolving in some way six melody and accompaniment yes now it goes without saying but just make sure you balance melody and accompaniment really really carefully always translate it out of guitar into something else it could be a string trio for example or even just a guitar ensemble so quite an interesting way of thinking is if i had to arrange my piece for two or three guitars how would i do it who would take guitar one where would i put the material in you know in the bass and guitar three who would take the inner voices how long would guitar one get the melody before i swapped it over to guitar two you know things like that that you have to think about so there are obviously places here where we have some really lovely musical material for example at the major section when we have this phrase so we've got a tune lovely tune and we don't want it to be drowned out by the other material underneath all right so i'm playing that deliberately badly can you hear how loud my open b is there's too much going on there's too much to digest so we need to make it more like a pop-up book you know stuff in the foreground other stuff in the background you know where is the melodic interest you quite often find you have to choose something if you've got voicing you know whether it's bark or whether it's a piece like this you know the cost you have to decide what you're going to highlight and lift out and what's going to be in the background you know think of a film you know lead actors supporting cast you know lead violin someone maybe playing you know second viola i'm not i'm not denigrating that in any way they're all equally important but they have different sort of roles to play within the musical setting and it's the same here you know sometimes the accompaniment is crucial to hear but we don't want to hear it too loud they always say for example in double basses in the orchestra the only time you should be aware of the double basses is if they're not playing <laughs> which isn't i mean it's not quite true but there's definitely an element of truth in it that quite often in orchestral things you know if you get to the end and someone says what did you think of the viola playing you know people say oh i don't know i don't really notice the viola playing very much unless they did a solo or something but you know, you might have noticed violin one or the lead orchestra or perhaps the timpani player at the back. You know, somebody who's visually kind of um, dramatic to watch. OK, let's move on to our next uh, next point. Pauses. Yes, pauses and how to measure them. So we have some pauses in this piece. There's one, for example, on the third line. Sometimes 
sometimes actually pauses always have a slightly different context and there's never ever one size fits all that works but in a strange kind of way what you have to do with a pause is to measure it you're, you're still counting in some ways or you're very much thinking about what's coming up one quite nice way of thinking sometimes can be to imagine throwing something up in the air and watching it land um, I mean that applies with all rhythms but you know you know something might fall and you could think of it in that way or you just imagine yourself counting very slowly one and two So actually what I'm doing there is I'm not really pausing mentally up here. It's more like a rallentando that creates space. And then I move on once I've thought about the measuring and the proportion. Now, having said that, I might go into a really, really glorious acoustic somewhere and play this chord, you know, and there's a lovely resonance. And I might hear something, you know, coming from the side or the back or anywhere and think, ah, that's a really lovely resonance. I can wait longer than I would normally have done. And conversely, I might play in somewhere that's very, very dry, you know, lots of carpet, lots of curtains, not much in the way of acoustic to support and enhance the sound. So I might move on a little bit quicker. So they're quite flexible concepts, but enjoy the silence. Sometimes it takes a lot of um, courage to wait in music, to do nothing. I mean, you're not doing nothing. Obviously, you're thinking about what's coming up, but always feel a connection with the next note, you know, this one. Now, if I wait too long, one, one people might think I've had a memory lapse, um, and two, the music somehow starts to lose its connection. It becomes harder to relate what comes next to what you've done before. It loses its meaning in a way. And conversely, if I move on too quickly, quite enough time to digest the flavour, if you like, of that. It's like, you know, eating a great chocolate or something. You know, just you want to spend a bit of time savouring. Savour the flavour. So enjoy it. You know, listen to the sound. And that's another thing you can do. Just listen to the sound decaying. Maybe when it stops, that's when you move on. So, you know, it can be very spontaneous. It might be that you have a plan as to roughly what you're going to do, but other factors will decide in that magic moment when you're performing live as to what you're going to do at that very point in time and that's actually sometimes what makes live performance so exciting and interesting is that people are making these sort of split second judgments about how they're going to shape and and phrase the music okay next one repeat how to vary yes varying repeats is tricky now funny enough we we talked about it a little bit a moment ago where we talked about the modulation so when you go back think about why you're repeating. So whenever we repeat anything, there tends to be a reason behind it. And I always have this idea that there's no such thing as an exact repeat because it happens in a different place in time. It's like the old, uh, what's the old saying? I'm probably going to get it wrong, but you never step into the same river twice. You know, you're repeating the same action, but it's not the same water that's going past your feet. So even if you're repeating something, it's in a different place. It's like when you go back to the same place on holiday, you know, it might be a year later, you're different, you know, the world's different, all sorts of things have changed, even though you're going back to that same fixed point. And there are lots of things that you can do to vary the music, but you have to have a clear idea about why you're doing the repeat. Sometimes it can be just something as simple as it's a great tune, I like playing it twice. And you're communicating an enthusiasm for that and the music just needs to be iterated twice in order to work. But sometimes it's to say something slightly different. It might be a slightly different dynamic. It might be a very slightly different colour. It could be that you're flexing it rhythmically to highlight certain things that you want to savour a bit more the second time round. It could be that it's a Baroque repeat and you're doing some kind of decoration and division and ornamentation. But always have an idea if you do the repeat. And of course, if the examiner lets you do the repeat, which always slightly winds me up, because I think people develop this idea that repeats are this bad thing that you should always get rid of. Uh, I mean, I understand the logic behind it because it's, it's a time factor. But, you know, be imaginative about your repeats and think about what you're going to do and what your plan is, if you like. I also have this idea that in order to be spontaneous, you have to have planned things. 
So you plan what you're going to do, but then you're, you're not a prisoner of that. You can do other things that are different and spontaneous in the heat of the moment. Okay. Next one. G-sharp major barry at the end of fifth stave. Yes. Um, now, why did I write that? I'm just trying to remember now. At the end of the fifth stave. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yes, there's a there's a barrier at the end of the fifth stave, a G sharp minor bar, G sharp major barrier. We're in a slightly alien key for many guitarists here. C sharp minor is not somewhere we tend to like to be very often, so it can feel quite an alien part of the guitar. I would find that barrier possibly slightly easier to overextend it. Now, strictly speaking, you only have to do two strings, these two. But if you overextend, sometimes it can feel more comfortable. Not always, because again, it depends on the length of your fingers. But that can sometimes feel quite stressful. If I just move it forward one string, it can sometimes feel a little bit more comfortable. And sometimes it seems counterintuitive, but even more strings. That brings my first finger out in line with the furthest finger. So the first and the third then are in line, rather than being slightly asymmetric. So just bear that in mind, barrets sometimes can be slightly movable creatures. All right, it might be that you only need to hold a half barret, but one extra bit of string might just make it feel a tiny bit more comfortable. So just bear that in mind. And also because it's not marked in the score, it's a sort of implied barret. You could jump, but it doesn't sound as good. See, if you look at my left hand, that probably doesn't look quite as comfortable as that. I find that one a bit awkward. That one feels a bit more comfortable. So, you know, have a play around with the barrets. You might find that there's just um, a little bit of uh, shimmying does the job. You also find that you've got, you know, these little folds in the, the sort of creases in your fingers. And sometimes the string will fall in a gap there that makes, makes it sort of produce a buzz. So you can sometimes just adjust the barret to avoid that. Okay, final point was to write in positional shifts, particularly in this C sharp minor passage. So, for example, we get to the end of the, uh, the previous section where we have... Uh, Alright, then we go up here, fourth position. Alright, so I would write that in, fourth position, then look out for the gliss. So you have to keep coming back to slightly different places for the fourth finger to gliss. But if you look carefully, your first finger is playing the barre here. In a minute, my fourth finger is going to be where the first finger is. So I quite often think this a lot in the left hand. To position my left hand, I think I look at something I'm doing now and I think in a minute I'm going to replace that finger with this finger. So they literally just swap over like people changing shifts, you know, like the midwife swapping on the sort of late shift, that kind of idea. So you've got D sharp, I'm gonna go straight to that D sharp. You can see it's the same as the barre, like that. It's quite interesting watching yourself play on the, on a computer screen actually, because your left hand moves slightly after you play, which is quite odd. So in a way, you might think of that, you could possibly even think of that as being first position. I'm not sure whether I would do it. All right, but you need to be just a little bit careful about the shifts on that passage because it's quite tricky. And I, I often write in, well, I nearly always write in shifts with a line, not just the Roman numerals, but with a line down through the stave. And then I see the stave in chunks or in blocks. And it becomes, again, visually easy for me to remember which passages then are in which particular key. Okay, so that was the end of the, uh, the cost melancholy. We're getting there. Next one is some bark. Let me just find my score for this one. Um, some questions. Yeah, Sibelius is the software I was using. Sibelius A at the moment I've got. Um, what do you think about while writing? Memories of summer. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, what was I thinking about? I was thinking about memories of summer. I was probably thinking about um, 
Uh, I mean, I've, I've been on holiday to, I've always loved the southwest of Ireland. So a lot of my, I suppose, artistic inspiration or reminiscing of places comes from there. So I'm not sure if it was specifically of that, but it was more that kind of feeling that you get, you know, in, and maybe this is a very peculiarly English thing or a sort of temperate climate, you know, northern European thing. But uh, when you get to the beginning of September, mid-September, and you start, you know, summer starts to sort of fade away. So it wasn't such a specific kind of place, but it was more to do with that general feeling you get if you've had a great summer and it's sort of gradually coming to an end. Again, slightly sort of melancholy. Left hand part. Inspiration for birds flew over the spire. That's a very good question. I have no idea quite uh, quite where I... I mean, I, I used to play the organ um, at a local church for many, many years. And, I, and I've always loved, oh, actually, no, I think I have remembered where I got the, the inspiration for Birds Forever Spire, because we talked about it in, I think I did a workshop here last time where I, I showed up a John Wells painting. That's right. The John Wells picture, which is on the previous workshop I did. So if you're interested in that, you should be able to find it. I think that's still up, Vida, isn't it? That, uh, that old, the one we did before. Yeah, I think I talked about it there. But I, what I was always interested in was I, I love this way that, that birds float on thermals of hot air. So they just kind of glide and they like gliders do they ride thermals up so i was the sort of idea for the left hand movements came from that that thought but it was nothing it's quite a hard thing i think composing is more about a sort of osmosis of many many things over many years that sort of come together in a way that you can't even quite define yourself it's a bit like you know when you drink a great wine there's something about it that you can't quite put your finger on why that is particularly good in relation to another one that you've had it just happened maybe the grape just happened to grow in a particularly good place had a good climate and you know circumstances conspired to make it come together in that way um good we must press on so bark now it's very tricky to compress bark down into um relatively short space of time but i'll i'll try and give you just some general thoughts uh, which apply not only to this bark allemande from the uh, E minor suite, which I never remember the BWB numbers yet. BWB 996. So it's the Alamar. <laughs> approximation of bark but it gives you a sort of feel for the piece if you're not familiar with it um now bark i mean you, you know you're dealing with somebody who's certainly considered i'm not sure if there is such a thing as a top five of uh, composers but top three top two possibly top one so th this is you know one of the greatest musical minds that ever lived and um you know there are the whole sort of I think even if you spend a lifetime in music, you know, you find new things in Bach and you don't really understand the full richness of it. Um, it sort of reminds me of that, um, was it Casals? Somebody sort of said to him, I think it was Casals who worked out that you needed three, you've worked out if you had as much time as you really need to master the cello, it's going to take something like 300 years. Um, and somebody asked him why he still practised when he was in his 90s and he said, because I think I'm getting better. <laughs> Which I... Which is, you know, I think the trouble is you get sort of you get better mentally, and then you're, you know, physically sometimes your fingers start to start to fail you. But I think you know, Bach is a lifetime of exploration, really. So especially if you're a young student, you know, you're just in the foothold foothills of this this wonderful exploration of all this music that's out there, and your your own ideas will change about the piece enormously as you as you go through, you know, your musical life and garner all sorts of um, advice and experience and knowledge about the music but there are lots and lots of things that go into a great Bach performance but I'll talk about some of them I mean the first thing to say with this is tempo now Bach is tricky because there's not necessarily a correct tempo and I, I had a quick look online just recently and I thought I'll have a look at some recordings and see who does what and I'll give you two recordings that you can try. I'll just type in the name in case you're less familiar. 
these are the two I particularly liked Jason Fuhr's one um, you'll find it online you don't need me to write in the in, in the details here but contrast these two recordings and and you will notice you know that they're very both are obviously great players and both of whom play at very very different speeds different tempos um, and, and in very different ways not necessarily better or worse just it's a, just a different approach but so you know choosing your tempo is um, is a big factor but of course that is governed by the fact that in a baroque suite it's dance this is a dance now people debate about how literally the music is intended to be danced to i mean that's a sort of separate issue but it the obviously the artistic idea is from an allemand it's a dance and you know if you've not seen anybody dance an allemand then you know try and find some information try and try and watch some um, clips on youtube you know, some quite interesting things to do with period dance and how people move and the music has become separated from its original meaning in a way i mean these were instrumental suites so they weren't necessarily designed to be danced to as far as i'm aware i might you know i'm not a scholar on this front so there might be somebody who, who knows about this more than i would and can correct me but um it's become separated and it's quite an interesting feature of music if you think of things like a film soundtrack so a lot of us go to the movies and really really enjoy a film soundtrack and some film soundtracks are great if they're just played as concert pieces but sometimes they don't work on their own as concert pieces because they're very much designed to be part of um, a visual experience and the narrative is driven by the film and the action in the film governs the form and the structure of the piece and when you take it away from that the music becomes altered and changed and perhaps not quite as rich as it would have been had you heard it in its original setting the same with a ballet you know when you see people dancing to something and then all of a sudden the piece is removed you know it, it can still sound fantastic as a piece of music but it really comes to life when you see people moving around to that music so this is a slightly different thing but you know be aware of what an, an alemán looks like and remember that people dance to it you know it becomes very bark is perceived as being very very academic music which of course in a sense it is but that's not how he conceived it to be I don't think, I mean, I know Bach did have a very didactic strand to his thinking, you know, and liked to, to teach people through the music that he wrote. But I think, you know, it's so much more than that. So, and I think people are slightly afraid of Bach, perhaps, because it seems a um, slightly scary thing. Sometimes if you're playing an exam or you're playing to a, a panel, all of whom, I always used to say to my students, as soon as you play one note with Bach, you've divided the jury. It, it's kind of like that. <laughs> You know, to be honest, he might have divided the jury before you even started playing when he walked into the room. But, um, you know, it's very hard. It's a bit like two economists. You get them in the room and they disagree with one another. I think musicians are a bit like that with Bach. That everyone has their sort of idea about how they think it should be played. And I think therein tells you something quite interesting about the nature of the music, that actually it's very, very rich and you can't quite pin it down to a, a correct version or solution. We don't have historical recordings. Obviously, there's a historical performance um, line of intellectual scholarship which tries to work out how the music was originally performed and played but I don't think we're a prisoner of that and nobody knows with any absolute certainty sometimes how these things should sound um, so you know remember it's it's dance music that's another thing and it was written for like many of Bach's things in sort of interchangeable ways there's a lute version and it's really keyboard music written on the lute clavicembalo so we're dealing with you know keyboard music conceived on a keyboard for the lute and then transferred to a more modern instrument in the form of a guitar which can obviously do different things to a lute and different things to a keyboard some of which are better and some of which aren't as efficient so it's tricky we're kind of transcribing it and, and arranging it in some ways from the original um, and you know the nature of a, of a keyboard is very different to the nature of um, the modern guitar and there are some things that one of the things that I always think about when I play this suite is it's in the key of E minor which you would think would be relatively straightforward and easy for the guitar but actually it's surprisingly tricky in some ways it's one of the the less idiomatic of the suites perhaps I mean that's that's a little bit more debatable but but to my mind um, 
one of the other things that's very useful to think about, and I don't want to go off too much on, on the, a theoretical tangent, but I'm just going to flip over to Sibelius. Um, and I'm just going to, just bear with me a second while I'm just getting something ready on Sibelius. I just need to do a quick time change. Um, live Sibelius always makes me a bit nervous. All right, I've got to do this. In fact, I could just flip it around so you can see what I'm doing, because that's probably more interesting for you at the other end. Uh, what I'm going to do the other sorry, slightly strange thing is you can't see the note pad I don't think on zoom I'm just going to do a bit of, bit of second voice. I'll just turn up the sound a bit, but can't quite hear what I'm doing there. This is probably how I would go about, you know, starting an arrangement, although I might play some of it in possibly on the keyboard. I've not bothered with the uh, upbeat because it just makes it slightly quicker just to do it this way around. I'll just put in the key. Where's E minor done? Right. Actually, that's a bit big, isn't it? I'll get rid of those parts. I'll leave it as it is. Okay, so. Hopefully everybody can see that. I've just I've just printed out the first bar. I need to have a, an F natural there, of course. All right, so that's the first bar of the Alemanne. And what I'm just going to talk about a little bit is is the nature of melody and melodic decoration and this this might be a bit dry for some of you but it might be interesting for others and it's definitely something you need to be aware of when you're playing i mean all sorts of music really but with bark it can be particularly important and we have what are called for example harmony notes okay so we're in the key of e minor and if we look at this page here what we've got is harmony notes on the first um one two three four five but the D here is outside the chord of E minor. So this is what we call a passing note. If you think of the chord of E minor, it's E, G, B. That's the triad. So notes outside that, like D and C and A and the F sharp, these are what we call passing notes. So if I took out all the passing notes, the piece would sound like this. playing the notes of the E minor triad. Now if I add in the passing notes, all right, you can hear we've got passing notes, but those notes are subsidiary and secondary to the harmony notes. In the next bar, we have what are called auxiliary notes, where we play, and that would be the E. Da, 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 da. So have a think about you can talk about this, you know, with your, with your teacher at some point, if it's of interest and relevant to you as a student. Have a think about harmony notes, passing notes, and you can have accented ones and unaccented ones, subsidiary notes. Auxiliary notes, which are notes, for example, that drop below and above um, 
another note and return to them. I'll give you examples. Most of you probably know the, the violin part eater. Well, if I take out the auxiliary notes, all right, we just have the E major arpeggio. As soon as we add the auxiliary notes, Just a triad, but with decoration, with decorations around those notes. Okay, and that's those are what we call auxiliary notes, lower auxiliary notes and higher auxiliary notes, but they're slightly secondary to the harmony notes, and that sometimes affects the way you shape and you inflect a line in Bach. So it's important to be aware of that. It's not sometimes people feel it intuitively, but it's an interesting dimension to the way a melody is decorated because baroque music really is about decoration it's about a harmonic fundamental progression that Bach puts underneath and then he decorates over the top obviously this is counterpoint and you know we can talk about that a little bit later on so think a little bit about harmony notes passing notes auxiliary notes things like it you know you can have appoggiaturas as well where notes are kind of creating tension and resolution with the harmony and all of these things affect how you design fingerings and notes can overring or not overring so for example when i start i could play this scale as a single line all right or i could let it overring that's not probably quite as appropriate because we've got passing notes that, are, that move in step. So we're, we're better off hearing a single line. But when we get to the end of the bar, obviously these notes can overring because they're harmony notes. You see, now I could play those separately, but they would sound wrong. I'll try and exaggerate what I mean. sound completely detached it sounds very very mechanical but once we get the voicing right so again in the next bar those would ring all right so you have to be very careful about what i call resonance patterns which notes you're allowed to ring and which notes you stop and make it sound like it's a single part so that we get the voicing of the bark you know really really clear and and that feeds into fingerings you know very very important i can't stress enough with bark um how important it is to put your fingerings in so <clears throat> let's say i was doing this addition for example um i might decide right i'm going to put some fingering in i will demonstrate i always find fingering really tedious actually on the so that's obviously going to be an open. I, I mean, yeah, even there I have a choice. I could be, I could play it on the third string. I don't think I would do that. The open string is a bit of a gift. And then I will carry on into uh, this bit. I would probably do this. But sometimes the process of entering it in or writing it in, in the score, also programs you, makes you think about what you're doing in a very, very meticulous way. If you're a, a golfer, golfers walk the course before they play the course. They go along and they, they, they walk the, the fairways and the greens and they look at the lie of the green and you know where the curvature of the grass is and all this sort of stuff so that they can try and get an idea of the right path to, you know, to hit the ball. In a sense, what we're doing is we're kind of getting to know every note in the equation at the beginning now I've got a choice I could do three one two or I could do four two three you know so if you have a guitar you can try those three one two or four two three I'm not quite sure I think I'll probably go for three in the bass 
think I'm going to do this. Shout if you can't see that. I can make it a bit bigger if necessary. In fact, I'll inflate the screen up just a little bit. There you are. Good for my eyesight, actually, as well. Okay, and then coming down. It's pretty straightforward, but I would probably use four on the D, like that. choice really one has to think about is whether to play an open B here or whether to do uh, a fourth finger on the third string you could possibly do that And then the next notes would be, for me, would be opens, like that. So that's just a very small snippet of right hand fingering that I've put in. You know, obviously, if I'm writing it in, it would have been a lot quicker, but it's so that you can see it clearly at the other end. So it's some of the sort of decisions I'm thinking about. And I'm probably going to start with the middle on the first B and the index on this one. You know, so it might be that I would write in, say, um, the index finger for the right hand up here and that reminds me that I'm going to land on that note and then I'm going to think right I'm going to start the E with the middle finger so it might be that I go on to the next one where's it gone here like this and I know that I'm going to start that run with the middle finger you know when I get to here I'm almost certainly going to do PIMA because it would be crazy not to really like that so can you see I'm starting to get a sort of proper feel for for what I'm going to do in the right hand and I sort of know every note in the bar all right I've got everything written in so when I come back to it tomorrow afternoon I can sort of see what I did what I wrote yesterday afternoon now, I might think it's rubbish I might think oh I don't like that fingering anymore but at least I get a, a glimpse of what I was thinking and what I was trying and what I was exploring and also it's making me think quite carefully about every note and every shape so I'm investing time now in the hope that it saves me time later on and Bach will reward you for this <laughs> I have this theory that it's almost like an act of duty you have to go through it you know for like it's like Bach's kind of saying to you look you just haven't spent enough time looking at my music carefully enough, so I'm not going to allow you to play it properly. But when you've spent enough time and you've been really meticulous and really careful and you've shown it the respect it deserves, then the music starts to emerge and, and Bach allows you to play it, if that makes sense. Anyway, it's a slightly uh, spurious theory, but I'm sure you know where I'm coming from. You know, So, you know, show it respect. It's, it's amazing music and actually it's so brilliantly constructed that one of the nerve-wracking things about playing it is that you feel if you make an error somehow you've immediately spoilt the whole thing it's almost like a sort of perfect perfectly constructed piece of sculpture or painting or something so that gives you a little insight into fingerings but you know be, be meticulous that would be my advice key changes okay so i will try and do this with a bit of narration but you know bach starts in e minor but he doesn't stay there okay so he starts in e and he's moved to G okay so that's our first our first movement our first chunk is in E minor next movement is in G where's G in relation to E G is a third above the relative major okay so he's moved to a different place he's gone from one town to another E minor in the bass is the leading note of B minor or B major okay 
Okay, so then we arrive at the halfway point. Well, not quite the halfway point, but it's, you know, the dominant at this point. So we've gone from E minor to G major to B. All right, so what's E, G, B? It's the triad of E minor. Can you see? So if you're trying to memorize things like this, which is often the case, Bach can seem like, you know, trying to, to memorize a telephone directory. You've got, you've got to think of it in chunks and blocks because it modulates from one key to another. And as a, as a result of that, you need to know where cadences are, all right? The, the classic definition, the cadence is a point of rest at the end of a phrase or a piece of music, okay? So we start off. Cadence is the end of chapter one, end of sentence one, end of paragraph one, however you want to think. Carrying on. Even that's a cadence into G. Admittedly, it's brief and it's passing. There's a sort of half cadence there. arrived at B, then of course he starts to move again. E minor, D major, back to B minor. Can't talk and play at the same time. Then he uses a cycle of fifths or circle of fifths. as opposed to the tonic minor at the beginning. But can you see it's a journey? So we're starting off E minor, G major, B major to the halfway point. Then he takes us briefly into D major. And of course, D major is the relative major of B minor, which is the minor dominant that you started off originally. So they're all, they're all kind of related and connected to one another, all the key relationships. And if you can understand that in Bach, you know, understand the keys and the modulations, and find the cadence points and that really helps you to understand the sort of grammatical structure if you like and also the harmonic rhythm is very very important because quite often the harmonic rhythm is moving in a very different way to the surface rhythm we might hear a you know big row of semiquavers on the surface but actually the harmony is changing maybe every minim beat every semi brief something like that it's not moving always in the same way. So let's say we took the first bar. Everything is harmonized with E minor. Then we get B major here, but then it moves here, 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 here. So if I play the harmonic rhythm, da da. That's the harmonic rhythm moving around. And the other stuff on the top is the decorative stuff made up of harmony notes, auxiliary notes, passing notes, etc., etc., which tells us how to carve out the shape and the contour of that line. So that's why, you know, it's, for me, it's absolutely crucial. And I always think you can kind of tell when people genuinely understand what's happening harmonically with Bach. They understand the tension and the resolution of the harmony they understand cadence points, and they also understand that feeling of evolution that Bach has. It very much evolves and it builds and culminates quite often in climactic points later on, almost like a big building gradually being constructed. So, you know, be meticulous about that aspect of what you're doing. Um, and then, like I said earlier on, incremental practice, this is a sort of variation on the IKEA technique, but quite often, you know, build it up in pieces. <laughs> show you what I mean.
Yeah. I'm just practicing going to each new point and exploring the the architecture, the join technically, so that I can isolate and hopefully notice technical issues or problems as I'm going along and try and solve them sort of in real time. So it's literally like, you know, building something out of Lego. I always think of Jenga, that great game, you know, where you pile all the bricks sort of on top of one another. And there's a danger, you know, if you don't build a good construction, the whole thing kind of falls down around you. So, you know, Bark will reward you for this process. You have to be patient. And actually, I think that's something I had to learn very much as a student because I, I sight read quite well. I sometimes have quite a quick idea of how I want something to sound. But actually, the process you have to go through to realise your vision of how you want something to sound is often very, very painstaking and slow and requires a lot of um, thought and meticulous attention to detail. And there's a sort of conflict between those two things. And I think you know, Bach particularly makes you... Um, explore that aspect of your studying and, and your music making good so i don't know whether that was uh, did justice to bark but anyway that's uh, the end of my bark chapter so now i'm sort of on to talking a bit about benga beat for the last you know 15 20 minutes or so um let me just have a quick look along through the questions in case there's some new ones uh, yeah, do you recommend listening to harpsichordists yeah definitely always listen to other instrumentalists my uh, my old uh, piano teacher used to recommend landowska playing um the prelude fugue in allegro actually there is a great recording of her playing on on youtube it's obviously a historic recording she plays the allegro so fast as well i mean there's no way actually i think on the guitar you could probably even if you could play it that fast whether it would sound good on the guitar at that speed is another whole issue i mean i, I always have this feeling that Bach designed pieces to be, it's almost like they exist outside of instruments and then come down and inhabit instruments. So, you know, think how different pieces sound on the cello to the lute. It's, it's a totally different musical animal, but you're playing quite often the same material. So Bach would recycle and adapt and change things. And I'm absolutely certain if Bach understood how to play the guitar, he wouldn't have written how we transcribe a lot of things from the lute suites and the keyboard repertoire. He would have modified them and made them slightly different. Now, that doesn't give us carte blanche to change them, but I think it's just an interesting thought to bear in mind. You know, his violin writing was incredibly idiomatic. His organ writing was incredibly idiomatic. So he understood the instruments invariably he was writing for. And I'm sure if he understood the nature of the guitar, there are certain things he wouldn't voice in a particular way because he would have understood that they don't always sit comfortably on the instrument. But but I would definitely recommend, you know, always translate out of guitar into something else. You know, if there's a keyboard, it's not when you play Scarlatti, always listen to the keyboard versions. If you're playing Bach cello suites, always listen to the cello. And, you know, on a wider level, if you're playing orchestral composers, you know, people like, I don't know, William Walton, Benjamin Britten, listen to other pieces, you know, listen to Peter Grimes, listen to Walton Symphony No. 1, Belshazzar's Feast. They, they give you um, an insight into the way people are thinking so that when you play their guitar music, you understand at a deeper level what it is that they're trying to convey and to communicate. Um, Shamal, yes, I may not have time. To, <laughs> I may not have time to talk about all these things, but yeah, I'll try. I'll try and do just a few sort of general thoughts. Um, I mean, I know Vida also mentioned Rondo Rodeo um, as a possible thing, but I think Possibly just for today. I mean, maybe we can make this the source of another workshop at some later date, Vida, if, um, if we don't get time to do everything today. You know, I can make it more composition focused. Um, but I'll stick, I'll stick with Benga Beat because that's sort of loosely what we planned. But you will find that some of the things I talk about um, obviously um, relate to all of those pieces as well. And a lot of the thinking is very, very similar in the way that I go about um, you know, writing pieces and, and thinking them up. <laughs> Sorry, we just had a bit of echo there. Okay, so Bengabi. Um, this piece is going to be 10 years old in April next year. Well, actually, it's about 10 years old now because I started writing it about 10 years ago. I like this idea that pieces have birthdays. <laughs> it's a 10-year-old boy, you see. Rondo Rodeo is 20 next year. 
It's a young adult now, you see, Rondo Rodeo. Um, so, yeah, where did I get the first... I got the idea for this piece. I can't quite remember what this... Well, actually, there was... Yeah, I won't go into details, but... It, it slightly sprang out of a disappointment about something, which I won't kind of go into here at some point, but there was something I was kind of a bit disappointed about, and I just thought, I'm going to write this piece, you know, I'm going to... It, was, it wasn't kind of... Um, I'm not sure I was kind of sort of trying to prove something, but I just thought I'm really going to, I'm going to really try and write an exciting concert piece. I did want, it was quite egotistical, if I'm really honest. There was a slight element of that, but I always found it slightly frustrating on the guitar and always have done that. There were lots of things I felt the guitar can do as an instrument. And I felt there were lots of things I was interested in as a musician that had absolutely no vehicle in the classical repertoire. You know, it was like I, I loved music and I loved the guitar and there were just pieces that I sort of enjoyed playing but just never ever allowed me to explore and display some of the things that I've gone on to use in the pieces that I've written. Now, of course, people will have mixed views on that and that's perfectly normal and natural. Um, but I, I did at some level feel and still do that perhaps the guitar is in danger of becoming a historical preservation society that is just always looking backwards, you know, at times gone by, uh, rather than sort of celebrating that and building on it and understanding that, that things always change and evolve in some ways. Now, I, you know, I don't profess to have all the answers at all, but I did find something slightly straightjacketing about it. And I think perhaps because I played piano as well, I've been immersed in a wider musical world. Um, and I played the organ. In some ways, my musical upbringing was slightly more connected to choral music, um, hymns and things like that. So I, I was kind of very much versed in that, obviously not being an orchestral player because I don't play an orchestral instrument. In a sense, I, it's a shame that I've, I've missed out on that. But obviously I participated in large scale choral things and I played the organ in choral things and very much got to know that sort of British choral tradition as well, which I've always really loved and really enjoyed. Um, but so I, I just sort of wanted to write something that was quite showy. And I think also because I'd written a piece for some good friends of mine called Mark Eden and Chris Stell, who I think, you know, the Eden Stell duo. And I'd written them a guitar duo called Generator. And I kept putting all of these fancy tricks and funny things in duo pieces. And I was thinking, well, I need to write myself a solo piece that has something a bit fun and flashy that I can do. And I'd sort of done it with Rondo Rodeo, with, which was... Um, slightly more intended a bit more as a sort of fun student piece to try and get people to play rhythmically and extrovertly and to explore extended techniques without it being um, a very modern dissonant language. I was quite interested in trying to get people to play modern techniques in a tonal language that was fun. And also I just felt fun and got slightly um, boiled out of the equation in guitar playing. You know, like a, like a vegetable that's had all the vitamins stripped out of it. You know, like it was no fun anymore. I just thought, for God's sake, you know, we can have a bit of fun in a recital. You can have, you can have profundity and you can have, you know, a huge range of music and still have a bit of fun. You know, and I just thought music is supposed to be about fun. That's kind of why we start off. And, you know, no one starts music for a career. They start it for fun, you know, to express themselves and to communicate with other people. That's fundamentally what it's all about. It's not a job. I mean, it becomes a job for people, but... That should never, ever be why you start playing music. You know, if that's the reason, give up now. <laughs> if you love music and you enjoy playing and it happens to turn into a job, that's great. That's fine. But, you know, don't go, don't go about it topsy-turvy from, from the other end. It's not really the kind of thing that has a career structure in the traditional sense, as COVID has painfully demonstrated as well. Anyway, I'm going off on a slight, uh, slight tangent, but that was just a little bit of the thinking behind it. And... I always like to do pieces that have a slightly different feel or a fundamentally different musical premise from the one before. That's one of my loose strands of thinking. So, for example, Shamal, which I wrote a fair few years after this, probably about two or three years afterwards, um, was, was a sort of Arabic exploration. And I decided that was going to be a sound world I wanted to explore. But it took me a bit of time to come up with something that was fundamentally different or felt different to Bengabi because that sort of... Um, I think sometimes once you've written a piece like that, I find it, there's often, a, it's almost like chopping down a plant. You've got to wait for something to grow up, you know, in place of it before something else comes up that takes its place. 
so I was always interested in doing different things. And recently, you know, my project over the last 18 months has been these folk tunes, which I, you may have seen possibly online, but I've been doing some arrangements of new folk tunes. And I decided that would be a really interesting thing to, to explore traditional tunes, but sort of reset them and reimagine them. So that was a very different project to what I'd been doing before that. So I don't quite know what's coming up next in that sense, but eventually something comes along that gives me an idea for something new that's quite different to what I was doing before. So, and I've always been interested in this idea about um, what are normal sounds and what are considered extended techniques. Um, so for me, it's interesting that, you know, obviously with a guitar, we all recognize you know, the sound of the strings being strummed and played and plucked. That's a sort of fundamental part of the instrument. But actually, you know, the percussive sound world is very interesting and the sort of unusual sonorities that it can make in, in all sorts of strange ways, which on their own sound a bit, you know, irrelevant and meaningless. But I was quite interested in trying to knit those sounds into a sound world where they're equal to the traditional way of playing. So it's like you're playing like a normal guitarist, shall we say, but you're also chucking extra plates and, you know, into the spinning more plates in the air. And the percussive sound was very interesting. I think I had played Jongo many years before, that great piece by Paolo Bellinati. Um, and I remember, you know, obviously learning the percussive section in that, thinking that sounded quite good. Um, and I played the Hinostera guitar sonata a lot when I was um, in my mid-twenties and sort of, um, you know, right through into the early 2000s. And I used to play it a hell of a lot. And so I learned a huge amount about, you know, the sound world of the guitar. I started getting very interested in... Um, you know, just, just the sheer range of sounds that the instrument could make. And then through playing things like Takamitsu um, and learning about harmonics and what I call a sort of upper dimension of pitch on the guitar, where you can find sonorities and sounds that you didn't really think you necessarily could. Um, and Roland Dion's, of course, the great late Roland Dion's wrote amazing arrangements and compositions that sort of really teach you a lot about how to uh, find your way around the guitar, how to understand the guitar. And Sergio Vassal, I loved playing Aquarelle, his amazing uh, solo piece when I was younger. So, you know, you, you learn about how to play, obviously to play the guitar through all of the repertoire that you learn. So even if the piece doesn't necessarily connect with you at a deep level, it teaches you something, which you then hopefully retain and you use in the next piece. And all of these things ultimately come together when you're writing. So you you have that sort of knowledge to draw upon in a way that's quite hard to define, which then contributes to the creative process. But also I've always felt quite conflicted because I do love pop music. Um, you know, I like pop music. I like light music. I, li I like music that's sometimes quite <laughs> frivolous and, and fun and sometimes instantaneous. You know, to me, there's nothing wrong with, you know, I think it's fair to say that sometimes a great piece of music you won't like at the beginning and you'll listen to it a few times then you start thinking actually this piece is quite good I'm really growing to love this piece and it becomes rich and you find all sorts of things in it that you didn't hear first time round. by the same token I think pop music teaches you something interesting in the opposite direction where sometimes it's instant sort of gratification you think oh god this is such a great tune you know I love this tune and you play it for weeks and weeks and weeks all the time and then you suddenly get sick of it you think I don't want to listen to this anymore I've had enough I've, you know I can't bear it. But you might listen to it again three years later and think, oh, I used to love this song. You know, this is a great song. So in some ways, I've always kind of felt slightly conflicted by that. that I, I love pop music and I love that sort of instantaneous feel. But I also like really serious music and properly constructed music. And I thought it'd be really interesting in some ways to try and perhaps at an abstract level blend those two things together. So it's almost like you're applying slightly more, um, I don't know, commercial music and light music um, feel or elements into something that has a proper structure and a pro you know like a proper piece of music rather than something that just goes on for ages and then fades out so th they were just sort of some of the the general thoughts of what I was thinking I mean my first tip for this piece is and for any piece but slow practice you've probably been told it lots of times in different master classes but it's the sort of thing that's got to be done slowly you know obviously I wrote it so I know it from the inside but I can't even begin to imagine what it probably feels like when you're coming at it as somebody from outside. Obviously, I've done recordings of it on YouTube that help in terms of being able to watch and see what I'm doing. So as a teaching tool, you know, that's an incredible thing to have at your disposal because I know people can go and play a bit, pause the button, you know, practice it, have a look again and see what I'm doing. Um, 
just be aware, they're a bit like Ronan Dion's, you know, you don't always necessarily play exactly what you end up printing in your printed music, but it's always a good, it's a good guide if you're watching me play it. It's probably pretty close to what I intended. So, you know, I would advise lots and lots of slow practice. Um, the metronome is absolutely crucial. You know, it's a very, very rhythmic piece and it just sit pretty much sits in a groove all the way through, which is exactly the same. You know, so once you get your main, do you know, I haven't played this piece for a long time, it's in lockdown, I've had a really good rest on this piece. It's quite weird coming back to it a few days ago. You know the feeling you get when you go back into your room, back into your house when you've been on holiday for about two weeks? It kind of felt like that. count out loud while you're playing that groove that's that's quite a good sign but there's no harm in going you know it has to start like that and it has to start on loops so you know again like the ikea drawer <laughs> number one and what you should also hear that's coming across. Can you hear it? Should we go? Now I like those sounds. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a bit weird, but I like that sound. I used them in another piece actually in Jungle Skate, which was sort of um, bird noises, animal noises, insect noises. They sound like little creatures. So when you're playing this, you're supposed to hear, but you're also supposed to hear that as well in the background. So it's like you get you get a sort of foreground sound and a background noise. So if I over pit. It's a bit like sort of machinery, you know, I was quite interested in that sort of uh, clockwork things or mechanical things. And... and the taps, I mean, quite often the taps, they're as much about creating rests as they are tapping. You know, if I, if I want to play that note short, I can't do it with the thumb, so I've got to do it with the left hand. And they happen to sometimes just create very casual light taps you know so I would you, you build them up very very slowly and practice looping bars and I've written here say the rhythm before attempting to play it so I have a saying with my students where I say say it don't play it all right so let's say we took that rhythm it's not that's not the rhythm that's the fundamental rhythm that's the surface rhythm but the inflection is like that so you can sometimes find a way of saying a rhythm that gives you the right feel for the thing. And quite often, you, you know, your, your brain and your, your brain is ahead of your fingers. So sometimes you can see and understand the rhythm before you can physically play it. So get the thought right in your head before you try and play it. Don't, don't let your fingers start to dictate how it should sound. Think how you want it to sound and then start trying to get your fingers to do what the idea is in your head. Now, obviously, with a piece like this, it's a bit like a jigsaw. You're trying to piece it together very slowly. And I appreciate, you know, there's a lot of information. When you get it moving, you know, the individual elements themselves aren't that tricky to play. What makes this piece perhaps hard, I, I mean, and I found this myself, is it's the quick thinking. You, you need to be very quick at thinking what's coming next and knowing what's coming next. And actually, also, having said that, if you think about it too much, you can't do it anymore. 
is if I suddenly start thinking about every individual unit, you know, and where I'm going, I, I all of a sudden I can't do it. It has to be like riding a bike. That was another sound. I always, always used to think it sounded a bit like bicycles. You know when you have squeaky pedals or old, you know, like spokes of wheels going around and things like that. So there's a sort of loosely mechanical feel. I toyed with singing at the beginning actually, which I didn't do in the end, but because I like the lower line. Sometimes I'm almost thinking about that more than but it's pentatonic basically. You know, and right from the beginning, think of the pulse. So I'm thinking one, two, three, four. So again, the slow part. I don't know what your finger click is like. Some people have said to me they can't do finger clicks very loud, which I understand. Your forehead is, a, is an option. Not really, by the way. I can't do it. Where's it going? It'd have to be there, wouldn't it? No, it's not loud enough. My friend Gordon Dunn wrote a piece for guitar, a sonata for guitar and forehead. See, that could be a good piece. That's, that's sort of where I get ideas from. There's a slight element of comedy, you know, wouldn't it be a bit mad if you did this? And then you try it and sometimes it's not quite as mad as you think. You think, actually, this is quite good. Most of the great things generally I was thinking in life have come from people who are slightly mad. <laughs> Or, or other people think they're mad. People thought Einstein was mad. But actually sometimes you need to be mad to think like that. I think there's always been a sort of slightly, you know, a slight element of that, that um, little boy thing. You know, when, um, you know when your parents tell you not to do something and you look at them and you kind of go, I wonder what would happen if I did that thing they told me not to do. And then they do it, you know, and they sort of get told. I've kind of, that sort of, I think that's stayed with me at some fundamental le level. I always joke that I'm a sort of six-year-old boy trapped in a 51-year-old's body. But there's, there's something of that element of play and fun, which I think you have to retain as an adult. You know, life gets a bit heavy as you get older. But you have to try and remember what you really enjoyed doing when you were about seven. Because they always say that that's sort of actually, um, that's fundamentally when your personality, how you are at seven is kind of how you are, apparently. I don't know if this is true, whether you, but maybe think about that for yourself. And then you also have an inner age where people, like people always used to say they thought Prince Charles was always 58, right from when he was about, you know, 23. And, and he always seemed, he kind of seemed happiest when he got to that age. You know what I mean? He's, he suddenly seemed to sort of settle into his own skin. So you have, you have a kind of inner age where I think somehow, you know, at some point in your life, I'm not quite sure where mine was, I think it was when I was six, but at some point in your life, you kind of reach a point where, you know, you've, you've landed in just the right place, you know, that sort of somehow suits your personality. But, you know, I think... You know, at a deeper level and on a more serious note, I think the danger is, is that, you know, and I alluded to it, is that music is, is fun and it starts out as fun and it's hard work and it's really difficult and it's very, very challenging. And it's not always fun and it shouldn't always be fun, but at a fundamental level, that has to be the driver of it, you know. And, and to me, it should, you know, I don't always think that when I'm standing in the wings waiting to go on stage, but it should be a bit of fun, you know, people, isn't, there's nothing wrong with having a bit of a laugh when you go to a concert, as well as hearing some great bark or some, you know, some Takamitsu or the Hinesteria Guitar Sonata. There's, there's scope for, for everything, really, you know, there's room for everything. And, and for me, I've always been interested in different music geographically and also chronologically and stylistically. It just seems, it's a very natural thing. It's not a contrived thing I'm doing because I think it would look good on a concert program. They're things that I genuinely enjoy and believe in and I think if you do that in a concert program or your exam pieces or whatever you know pick pieces that you like that you genuinely want to play and that you have something interesting to say because if you're communicating your enthusiasm then your audience will relate to that at some level however well or however badly you play they will understand that there's a there's a message coming out from that um now what did I write here so say it don't play it 
Practice singing on its own. Yeah, the singing's quite hard, actually. Um, one of the other things that's quite hard, I mean, and also you know, the way you sing, breath control, I mean, I'm no singer full stop, but breath control is hard when you're playing the guitar because physically you're expending energy. So you have to kind of, you know, get the tune. You know, practice it on its own. Just get it up and running. Or you could maybe, if you've got to the point where you can play some of it, if you can play the groove underneath, it goes... Record that separately. You know, record it and then practice singing over the top so you feel how it, it slots together. And then just think, always think about which notes that you're singing land with which notes in the guitar part. All right, so if I go, uh, when I start, I'm playing exactly the same notes. All right, so they're synchronized together. <clears throat> so the start is quite easy. But the A has to fall on the F on the slur. Sometimes if you know which left hand note synchronizes with the element of your voice, that can make it easier to coordinate the singing. Um, I did see one guy actually recorded it and I think he pre-recorded something where I had, I think he had something like a cello playing it or something, but you know, maybe people, perhaps you can whistle if you're no good at singing. Actually, that is something I've often thought about. It could potentially go into a piece, but you see, I remember getting the idea, these are all coming back to me now. I remember hearing something years and years ago where it was a brass player. I think she was playing something like the tuba. And she played this amazing piece where she sort of had to blow, blow notes on the tuba and then she would hum a note and then blow and then hum a note. And it was the most extraordinary sound. So you could hear singing, you know, in, in sort of uh, interlocking with traditional brass sound. And it was the most extraordinary sound. I thought that's such a great idea. So I think composing is very magpie-like. You know, you pick up a little... A little bit here and a little bit there. It's like kind of building a nest. You think, oh well, yeah, I just steal that idea. That's quite good. I'll, I'll make that. That's a good idea. I'll have a go at that. And you, and you sort of compile all these things, and they end up in a big, you know, big pile on your table. You think, what the hell am I going to do with all these ideas? And you've got to somehow filter them out and decide what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, but I, I know that some people have said they find the singing difficult, uh, which I totally understand. But the, the, just to stress, the syllables are just nonsense syllables. You know, if you ever watch scat singers. I always think of Cleo Lane. John Williams used to work with Cleo Lane in the 1970s and she was a great scat singer. Just that sort of jazz sound where people just use, you know, very spontaneous sounds that come into their mind. So don't feel you have to learn or remember the words in any way. It can be, and even the melody itself can be a little bit more flexible than it's written on the page. There are places later on when it goes, the right hand is playing the tune. index finger playing the tune so sometimes I'll focus in on very specific stepping stones inside the guitar part that help me think about where the tune is but it is hard and sometimes you're just out of breath you know especially if you're nervous or if you you know I didn't get to the point ever I mean I played this quite a lot actually in six hands but I never got to the point where um, I think I had a cough, quite a bad cough. Um, I mean, this is going back a couple of years, you know, obviously it wasn't COVID related, thank goodness. But um, I had a, quite a bad cough and I was a bit worried whether I was going to be able to sort of sing this thing without, you know, breaking into a coughing fit halfway through. But I suppose that's the only thing that slightly precludes you being able to sing it. Humming is another option, of course, I suppose. You could always hum if you're no good at the uh, singing. I've yet to hear someone play it with a soprano treble clef, you know, voice. Female version would be good. Or male countertenor. <laughs> like Blackadder. Um, what have I got next? Yes, I've talked about the, the melody doubling. Quintuplets. Great word for quintuplets. Hippopotamus. So, for example, in bar 65. Hippopotamus. How you can measure the rhythm, all right? Don't say it out loud, whatever you do. I know it's I know it's based on African music, but that's not why it's hippopotamus. <laughs> hippopotamus. Maybe I should leave that in. It's quite good, isn't it? 
I was quite interested to see in African music you get slightly lazy rhythms. So if I played this Baroque. <laughs> strict in a way and African rhythms are quite lazy see what I mean it's not quite it's like you know something that's become a bit unstitched you have to play it like you almost can't play it got all the time is a pulse. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. You see, so you've always got a main beat, but what happens sometimes in the middle can be just a little bit more um, bendy and elastic than it looks on the page. So just, just be aware of that because I always feel from 62 when it goes into that F major pattern. Just a slightly lazier rhythm than, than prior to that passage. Uh, and hippopotamus is great. So I used to have a thing with my oral students. You do it with animals. You go ant, tiger, elephant, armadillo, hippopotamus. So that gives you one, two, three, fours, and fives. Ant, tiger, elephant, armadillo, hippopotamus. I can't remember what six was, but lesser spotted woodpecker is seven. Lesser spotted woodpecker. <laughs> If you've ever seen the Lesser Spotted Woodpecker, Lesser Spotted Woodpecker. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Anyway, you can sometimes think of words, you know, that help you measure things. Because that's quite an interesting. It's a five across a two. So it's like a two, you know, five beats within a two. One, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Like two and a half per beat, you know, in a way. But you don't think of it like that, you just think of it as one thing and a five dividing across the, you know, across the sort of um, gap, as it were. Yeah, and then there was another little rhythmic thing, differences between triplet and semi quaver quaver. Yeah, when you get this rhythm, um, da 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 Now, where's that? I can't remember where I was, where I was thinking of. I think it's, oh, it's later on, isn't it? Yeah, it's in the major section. Yeah, you know when you have this rhythm? Da, 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 da. I always think of um, We Are The Champions, We Are The Champions. This always reminds me of Woody Woodpecker, this bit. Did you ever watch Woody Woodpecker? Anyway, it was always to remind me of that and that Tedesco do out his bit. I used to start like that, it always used to remind me of Woody Woodpecker. It's terrible, once you get that in your head, you can never get it out again. If, if things are... If pieces of music remind you of something else, you just can't, you can never shake it off. It's very, very annoying. Um, anyway, so this rhythm is very different to a triplet. Da 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 Just be aware of that because it's mathematically they're incredibly close. If you think of a triplet, da 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 and you think 0, 33.3, 66.6, 100, all right, let's think of that as percentages of a beat. Da 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 we are the champions. 0, 25, 75, 100. Okay, don't worry if you don't understand this, it's, there's not a test or anything at the end. But 25 is the first beat, and in the other one, 33%. So there's only 8% difference with the placing of that unit in a beat which is often a beat moving faster than a second. Okay, so 8% maybe of a note that lasts half a second could be the inflection that makes it sound one rhythm or another. Can you see what I'm driving at? So, and, and well actually we do this all the time with speech because we pick up little signals from people about inflection and, and placing of words so that we, we understand sometimes the meaning, uh, you know, an emotional level. It's like head, head gestures, quite interesting sort of thing you know, the way people hold the angle they hold their head can change the meaning of a word for example little things like that so rhythms often have you know in a different context slightly diff similar things for me and you get it a lot in latin music as well that um and then having said that sometimes the triplet is more elastic it can be a more expressive thing but 
just you know be very meticulous about those rhythmic properties because I've always thought that rhythm has has an emotional property. So we tend to think of notes as the emotional things, but actually the placing and the inflection of the note is what gives it the meaning, which is what makes it mean one emotion or another, or one energy or another. So, you know, that, that for me, that's why rhythm is meticulously, you have to be really meticulous about it. And it's so important. It's like the sort of framework and the scaffold on which everything hangs, or like, um, you know, a magnetic field is another one I often use as a sort of analogy. It's a sort of hidden force in the background that kind of keeps everything really, really nicely in position. Okay, bar 126. I'm nearly there, last two points. Um, yeah, this one's probably the hardest one to work out, was the one where people have to do the... that one, which is bar 126. And I was just going to show you how that... Um, how that worked in slow motion because people have often found that quite tricky. I mean the first thing is that there's a sort of action where you you strike the fingerboard at the 12th fret. Those of you old enough like me to remember Mark King from the 1980s level 42, great bass player, like this sort of popping bass sound which I could never do but he was always really good at it. It's, it's almost like a sound where you hit and you pluck at the same time. So the first thing is this left hand. So there's two taps. And then you touch 12th fret. So again, think of Brower's piece, A Cuban Landscape with Bells. That's sort of where I remember first learning that technique, you know, where you did the, the right hand comes over and taps the strings on the fingerboard. You know, great sound. I thought that's a really interesting sound. I'll kind of score that away. But you've got to land accurately, because of course you can miss, you can fall off a guitar altogether. So that's the first bit. Then what happens is the left hand has to hammer on at the third fret on the sixth string. So that's the first bit. Here's the slow-mo version. Then once you've done that, the right hand slurs. That's the one that slurs. Because it's the right hand pulling off, you know, like it would do plucking, but it feels like a slur. And after you've done that, the left hand hammers the G. how I remember where I'm supposed to be playing. Right, left, right, left, right. And then the right hand pulls off and then it has to go back to the pits. So it's quite a lot to remember at the end. Once you come off, that's the next bit. So again, think of this increment. I'm building it up one piece at a time. And then I'm back there. So I don't know if that, you know, if some of you are looking at it, you might find that helps. And then the final bit was um, the guitar throw in bar 219. So when you have to, you hit the harmonics, of course you have to do this big throw. I don't know whether that comes across on the microphone, but... Can you hear the wowing, yeah? I'm not sure. Yeah, great. So obviously what you're doing is you're closing this, you know, the sound is travelling down and then up again. And you need to try and do it to the rhythm printed. Dun, dun, yun, wah, 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 wah. Can you see it's written with a rhythm? Dun, wah, wah, wah. 
to try and follow the rhythm. One, two, three, four, one, 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 one. So again, even there, you're thinking there's a rhythmic thought kind of going on underneath there. And then you've got to get back into position again, you know. So there's something quite disconcerting about lifting up. And what, what always happens to me is because I use mats when I'm playing. Whenever I played this, my mats always used to come off and fly off around the around the stage onto the floor. And then, you you know, you, that's no good when you put your guitar back on your trousers, it ends up sliding around all over the place again. But I did I, I did come up with a method method for keeping the mat on my leg. I had to sort of tilt forward and then lift it up. So there's all these funny things that you have to think about when you're playing, you know, about no one thinks when you're playing it that I'm thinking, well, I wonder if my mat's going to fall off my leg. <laughs> you know, quite often performing involves strange abstract thoughts like that you know like, oh, I've got an itchy ear or you know oh god I've got a cramp in my left foot you know something strange like that that happens people think you're there in this sort of magical world experiencing you know all this wonderful art and everything sometimes it's easy. sometimes you just think I'm hungry god I'm really hungry I need something to eat you know <laughs> I'm sure there's a whole uh, someone's probably done it already but a whole comedy sketch and just the sort of narration of your own recital as you're going along and what's actually going on on that kind of inner monologue maybe I should do that on my YouTube channel so, you know, just a few very general thoughts about that, but I find, obviously, you just need to make sure you hold on to your guitar properly, because you don't want it ending up flying out to the front row of the audience. But just tilt it down and, and up, and it will, you know, and just make sure that you're in a good position to be able to get back. Quite, It's quite easy just to throw it out and just put your hand back into position. You, even that element of it, you can practice, you see. So it's, a lot of it's just basic rehearsing of the, of the units, but... I've never had to learn this piece other than it's, it's weird when you write it yourself because in a sense it's sort of designed to do things that you find quite idiomatic and natural anyway within your own playing. Um, so I can't quite imagine what it must feel like. I mean, I've done similar things with other people's pieces where I've had to work out, you know, the, and decipher them before you play. But I think that's what makes it tricky. There's a lot of deciphering needed before you start playing it. But... My advice is just to practice individual, you know, each bar in a strange kind of way quite often is an exercise in its own right or can become a sort of exercise in its own right. And, you know, and if you can't quite work it out, just go and have a look at the, the video on YouTube and see if you can decipher it from, from what I'm doing on there. Um, the funny thing was when I recorded that, I had not actually written a note of the piece down. It was all in my head. So um, I just sort of quite spontaneously decided to, to do it at that point in time. But there are there are a few very subtle differences with what I finally ended up notating, but it's pretty much the same, the same thing. Um, but I don't know how many times I've played that piece now. Probably quite a few. Um, but actually, it was very nice just to give it a rest. I mean, COVID obviously forced that on me in a way. But I thought um, I'm going to give those pieces a really good rest now because there was no imperative to have to play them. And actually, in the process, you know, I've I've written some new or added some new folk arrangements. I've done a Bach cello suite transcription. You've know, done some new things, which creatively is, I think it's really important to renew and, um, you know, to learn new things. Otherwise, you just become very good at playing your old pieces all the time. Um, but you, you don't sort of develop your playing in some way. So, you know, always have something new on the go, even if you've got a program up and running, you know, that's, that's polished. Good, now let's have a quick look at our... Uh, yeah, generators. Again, I'll have to talk. I think what we'll do is I'll, I'll have a chat with Vida. We can talk about this another time. I'll do another workshop at some point with, um, uh, you know, discussing some of the ideas in, in a few of the other pieces. If, if you find there's enough interest and, and, uh, and demand for that. There's always demand. And yeah, OK. Because <laughs> we people are mentioning things like generator and shamal. And actually, I've got the score from the shamal is quite is going to be ready quite soon. So that could be more useful when that's finally done. Uh, how do I emphasize amplify the left hand bicycle sound so much? Um, well, I think it's just you just have to find the sweet spot. You know, if you if you hammer a note and you gradually introduce pizzicato in the right hand, you start to hear a mixture of the note you're hammering onto and the noise. The noise comes from behind the fret, basically. It's this sound at that end. So what's happening is the string is vibrating on the frets behind the finger. So obviously you don't want that to be too loud if you're playing Bach, you know, or something like that. You want to hammer that on so we hear that noise. But for me, I thought it was quite interesting because it creates a pitch. And I was thinking, ah, oh, well, I could use that pitch. If you know what the pitch is, then you can start using it as, a, as an idea. You think, well, I could put that in here because it would fit. 
Um, but it's to do with the blend of pizzicato and hammer. So start with nothing. You can hear it changing as I move along. So that, that would be my advice for that. Okay. Right. I think we're... Yeah, someone says to me, do you have to be married to... Some people have asked me that before. Do you have to be married to, for the wedding ring on the side? You can put a ring on any finger. Some people are good. I've got, actually, I've got quite a good double joint on my, on my, that's my little finger. I mean, there are some, you can create loud sounds other ways, but actually, funny enough, I wrote an ensemble piece in the UK for a youth ensemble and they had to use rings, but they had these little wooden ones that they put on another finger. So yeah, you, doesn't, you don't have to be married. Don't get married just for this piece. Christ, that would be a disaster. <laughs> I'd really like to play Ben Capi, but I'm not married. Uh, would you like to marry me? Thank you very much. I can play it now. <laughs> what a surreal thought, I never thought of that. <laughs> but uh, yes, it's just a happy accident, just a happy accident. And my finger got so fat I couldn't take it off. <laughs> Any married man there will identify with that one. Although actually recently during lockdown, actually I did manage to kind of, I took my wedding ring off the other day, it came off, I must have lost a bit of weight with all that walking I've been doing. My daughter was amazing, she goes, God, that was quick. Goes, anyway. On that slightly surreal note, the workshop will now end. <laughs>